afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm here today. I'd like to introduce Ms. Jordan Hoffman. She's a senior here at Virginia Tech. She's majoring in crop and soil science, and she's minoring in wetlands science. Uh, she is going to talk to you guys today about invasive species in wetlands, and uh, she really got into this just growing up, uh, fishing, hiking, being outdoors, and uh, Invasive species are a problem here in the wetlands, and with decreasing wetlands like they are today, that's something you guys should really pay attention to. Uh, so here's Jordan with her uh, talk to you guys about alien invasion, the harm and havoc invasive species wreak. Thank you for the introduction, Paul. Well, good afternoon, everyone. So today I'm going to be talking to you about some of the ecological damage invasive species can have, why they're so successful at becoming so invasive, and some of the direct impacts that invasive species have on wetlands. So first and foremost, let's discuss what makes a species considered invasive. Does uh, anyone know the definition of invasive or invasive species? Could you repeat that? Is it something with like no natural predators or defense, like the natural environment can't defend against it just spreading? Yeah, that's part of it. Uh, is it something that was introduced to an area that wasn't originally native to it? Yeah, very good. So an invasive species, contrary to popular belief, doesn't always have to be exotic. A lot of people think if it's coming in from another country, it's automatically just going to become invasive. But an invasive species is designed, uh, defined as any species that has an economical or ecological harm to a particular environment in which it is not native. So that can mean a plant in your neighbor's yard that is fine there, he wants it there, like mint, and then it gets into your yard and just completely takes it over, and you have to spend time and money to get it out. So it can apply to a lot of different things. So an example of ecological damage that invasive species have is the American chestnut blight. The chestnut blight fungus came in on Chinese chestnut trees, and they're important for ornamental purposes, for good intentions. So what happened was, the chestnut blight fungus became invasive and attacked our American chestnut trees, which were not tolerant or resistant to this disease at all. Uh, Pimentel et al. states that approximately 25% of all eastern United States deciduous forests were composed of American chestnut trees before the blight hit. And once this blight hit, it wiped out all of the chestnut trees, and they were one of the largest uh, canopy, filler, canopy fillers in our forest. So when that happened, maples and oaks and hickories began to fill that canopy space, lowering the biodiversity in the forest. And Roy et al. stated that any species dependent on the American chestnut for food or shelter or any resources were greatly reduced. So the loss of just one species can have a chain effect in that environment. It doesn't just affect one species. So beavers. Beavers are not considered invasive in the United States, but they are considered in other countries. And what a lot of people don't realize is we get in a lot of invasives, but we send out just as much. So beavers were brought into Argentina and Chile to try and simulate the birth of a fur trade. And what is it they say about good intentions? What is it they pay? Yeah, well that happened. So what happened is the beavers escaped captivity and they began to breed. And then those beavers began to do what beavers do best, and that is build dams. And building dams takes a lot of trees. And the forests in Argentina, according to Worth, over 50% of their forests were lost because their trees simply could not recuperate or regenerate due to the damage from beavers. And they had no natural predators, no natural competition, so they just were able to become extremely invasive. So another common invader, I'm sure a lot of you are really familiar with, is the kudzu vine. And again, these nasty vines were imported with good intentions, for ornamental purposes. And remember what we said about good intentions. It was soon found that they had erosion control properties, and so they began to start planting it in any area they thought needed to be controlled for erosion. Well, what they didn't account for is the fact that these vines can go up to, grow up to a foot in one day and they will effectively cover the entire forest floor and just climb up all the trees into the canopy and eventually will smother the trees and the weight of them can even bring the trees down. So it's not to say that 
all species introduced for ornamental purposes, agricultural purposes, you know, always turn out bad. I mean, technically, did you know cats and dogs are considered invasive? But no one really knows that because it's usually a good circumstance. But it's when we don't understand the possible repercussions where we find ourselves in trouble. Like, don't flush that little python maybe down the toilet because it's going to grow up into a big python in the Everglades. So, I want to get into some of the traits that make plant species so successful as invaders. And the top one is that most of them function as asexual, so they don't have to produce seed. So just some other traits, high growth rate, good dispersal, small seeds, if they produce seeds, high capacity for unipartial reproduction, which is asexual, high competitive ability, and the absence of any specialized germination requirements as the absence of any other similar plants in that environment. So just a little more in depth with asexual reproduction. The top method is vegetative reproduction. There is another method, but it's a little more confusing, and this is how it's typically done. So what happens is these plants are able to reproduce from almost every single part of the plant. Now, not all plants can reproduce from every single part, but for the most part, it's the rhizome and solens that tend to be the biggest problem because a lot of people will come in with good intentions to an area and say, oh look, this invasive species has really taken over, let's get rid of it. But they don't realize that underneath it's all rhizomes. So they'll go in, till the area, cut it out, and they're just quadrupling the amount of plants that are there. Unless they really take all the time to bag it and completely remove it, which a lot of people actually don't end up doing. So what's so good about uh, asexual reproduction is that, like I mentioned, they don't produce seeds, so they skip over really energy intensive processes like forming seeds, fertilization, meiosis, and they also skip over energy intensive stages like when the seed breaks germination or breaks the shell that takes a lot of energy and germination takes a lot of energy. And then seedlings and juvenile plants are very highly susceptible to disease and damage. So they actually can just skip over that because you're literally going into an area with one plant and that one plant creates all these little plantlets and just one plant can take over a whole area. So just a little bit about animal invaders. Some of the traits they possess that make them such good invaders are pretty similar to plant species. They have a lot of babies in a short amount of time. They're able to spread wide and far. They don't have any competitors or predators in that area, hence the python. And they essentially, similar to the custody vine, they just can come into an area, breed, multiply, completely spread out that area, and make it even wider, and just push out any other competition and predators and just choke out the area. So let's get into wetlands. So one common invader in wetlands is nutria. So has anyone ever heard what nutria are called? No? Beavers with a Cajun accent. So that's because these pesky little mouse beavers, and I kid you not, their name literally translates to mouse beaver because they look like a beaver, but they're just smaller and they have nasty little rat tails. So like the beavers in Chile and Argentina, they were introduced here to stimulate the fur trade. And guess what happened? Those good intentions at work again. So the nutria escaped. Also because our fur trade plummeted. So a lot of times they either escaped or they were released. And nutria have a lot of babies. They can breed within three to, more, three to four months after being born. Their gestation period is only 130 days. And they can have up to 13 babies in one litter. So they're quite ambitious. So what's really so bad about them for wetlands? Well, they eat a lot of vegetation. They eat up to 25% of their body weight in one day. And all those little babies I mentioned, they can start feeding on vegetation within hours after birth. So they will come in and rip it up with their nasty, terrible teeth and dig up the roots, eat the roots, they prefer the roots, but they will eat every part of the plant. And so by removing 
all of this vegetation, they're opening up this wetland to erosion. And because there's no vegetation slowing the wave action and tidal activity, it just gets pounded away at, and eventually your wetland is going to look like this. This is a normal, pretty, healthy marsh, and this is what nutrient do. They also burrow extensively through the wetland, and they create all these terrible little paths and channels, further destroying the soil stability. So, in conclusion, invasive species are really bad. They can just come into one environment and completely destroy it, and they don't just affect one species in there. You know, they may affect the one they're in competition one, but it's a chain effect. An ecosystem is not just a one thing, it's fluid. So, it's really important that we begin to enforce stricter regulatory laws. There are laws in place, but we need to enforce regulatory laws, not only nationwide and statewide, but I think countywide. Because a species in this county may not be native to the next county, but it may do well here, but we go put it in the next county and it becomes invasive. And a lot more education <laughs> needs to go into the species that we're thinking about putting into wetlands because we're already losing enough wetlands. We don't need to lose any more because we didn't think enough of it. So, thank you. Any questions? Is there like a test for invasive or they just toss them out there and cross your finger? There is. There's uh, like an equation where you can determine its invasive probability rate, mm -hmm. but a lot of times it's just from people just like going to another country, bringing in stuff, or going and trying to plant stuff in this area, not realizing it. You know, a lot of times it's just people not thinking. Um, I don't know if you know that just because I mean, don't mean like that, but you know, it's a little difficult. But so, like, you, you gave an example of how, like, the uh, beavers in Argentina, like, the forest couldn't support them. So, wherever nutrient had come to, how can that ecosystem support them if they're so devastating? Well, it's like with the beavers, like here, they're not considered invasive because they've like, always been here for the most part. So our ecosystem has evolved to be able to contain them. And they, I think they come from Canada and they're not invasive there. So it's like other species do perfectly fine. Like the gray squirrel here, it's not terribly invasive, but they've been imported to England. And the red squirrel is their squirrel and our gray squirrel has completely pushed it out and caused diseases for it. So it's just like one invasive species may not be invasive in other countries, but it all depends.